Hey friends, I'm Otis Gibbs, and this is my buddy Eric Amble. He's going to share some stories about Guy Clark, Jerry Jeff Walker, and Towns Van Zandt. The fall of 1975, I go to college at the University of Wyoming in Laramie. I join the concert committee so I can, you know, get into shows for free. And one of the first shows that I worked was Jerry Jeff Walker and Guy Clark opened up. And I, I knew about Jerry Jeff Walker, but I didn't yet know about Guy Clark. So I was one of the 10 kids that's standing in a line and the tour manager can pick one or two to help you do stuff, right? And uh, so I'm standing there and I got my hair's a little longer and I got sort of a semi-Western shirt on, and, and I have a marijuana belt buckle. The guy goes, I'll take that guy. Goes, Come on, kid. And he takes me, and it's like, I'm, I'm going to go, I'm going to help out, right? So he takes me through the backstage and outside and onto the tour bus. I'm on a tour bus for the first time in my life, you know? I'm just barely 18, and... Uh, and he's like, have a seat. You know, I'm sitting there at the little table. He reaches up here and pulls down like a two-pound bag of marijuana. And he's like, okay, you know how to do this? You know? And it's like, yeah, yeah. He's like, okay, there's 13 guys between the two bands and the crew. Everyone gets three joints. So roll them up, you know. <laughs> So that's my first job in, you know, the music business. And, you know, Jerry Jeff was great. Guy Clark blew me away. So immediately I'm, you know, buying the record and, and I become a fan. And uh, the tour that I saw, that Guy Clark only did one full band tour ever in his life with drums and everything. And that was it. And... Steve Earle was the bass player. You know, I saw that gig, and then that uh, when I went home for, I don't know, Thanksgiving or Christmas, I saw that they were playing in, in Evanston, and they're playing this dry... Evanston's a dry town, and they're playing this sort of folky joint, and I was like, man, if I get a couple cases of beer and bring them, I'm, I'm really going to look good, you know? So I brought the beer, and... You know, so I was a big fan, and I learned about Towns over the years, and the photo that you're asking about, the, there's this photo of Guy and Towns, the woman, Tamara, who made the, the Guy movie, she saw that photo and asked if she could get a copy, and she wanted to use it in the movie. It's, it's, it is a good, the two of those guys look really cool, and the, you know, Guy's got his big ring on that he wore for his whole life. So I had just gotten married, and Sid Straw uh, was asked to be go to the Winnipeg Folk Festival. And uh, she asked me to go with and play with her. I, I can go, Sid, but, I mean, this is two weeks after my wedding, so you have to bring Mary Lee also. She's like, okay, so we all go, and right away we bonded with Guy and Towns. They they had been playing gigs together, and we were on. Like, I got to do one of those uh, workshop things with Guy, and he's singing his song. I'm joining in on harmony and stuff. And uh, that photograph that you mentioned just before that, there's another photograph of him with his arm around me, and he's, like, in my ear. And I had been extolling how, you know, the folk festivals are really different than rock festivals. What do you mean? Like, on a rock festival, you get two cases of beer, you know. Here you get two drink tickets. What are you supposed to do with that? And I had said something like, well, you know, I am kind of a drug magnet. And he goes, well, you know, then get on it, you know. It's like, what do you want? What are we supposed to get? And he's like, I'm, it's like, I want some serious adult drugs. I'm like, oh, okay. So we hung with Guy and Towns, and at those folk festivals, 
every, you know, the, all the artists are staying at the same hotel and they usually have like an artist after party. And that, and I, I saw so many things. That was the first time I saw the Calton case, you know, the, that fiberglass case, it, it, they still go for a thousand dollars, you know, that those guys and, you know, like rock dudes in the eighties, early nineties, they had like Japanese guitars that they would take on tour. They weren't touring with their real guitar, you know, or a reissue or something where these guys, they've got vintage Martins and they're carrying them in this case. And, and those guys knew even more about it. Like, you know, they got the cases in white. It's like, why did you get the case in white? And it's like, because it has to sit in the sun. You, you don't want, to, you know, I was like, wow, I'm, I'm learning all these things. Half the reason guys start playing music is so they don't have to dance. They could just be in the band and not have to dance. So at the after party, Towns Van Zandt, is, he comes up to me, he whispers in my ear for a minute. And then and Mary Lee, my wife, is like, what do you say? He's, well, you'll find out. And then he asks her to dance. But he asked my permission first because he's a Texas gentleman. You know, the picture that I don't have that I see in my mind, Winnipeg is flat like a pancake. And so we're at this hotel that looks kind of Soviet and huge, you know, and it's just a flat parking lot and we're waiting for the bus and there's hangovers all around. And those two guys are, are sitting on their Calton cases with their heads in their hands, you know. The Calton case comes to rescue again. You know, I'm standing there in the sun with my Takamini on my shoulder. And I got to see Guy other times, and I got to meet him again when I was playing with Steve. He came to uh, Steve's, I think it was the 50th birthday, big party at the Station Inn. Guy was always friendly to me. I saw him, uh, He, you know, when he was out there doing it, by, I think he really enjoyed not being alone doing this because I saw him a couple times when he was totally by himself, like this one particular time at Maxwell's, he's by himself and he goes on stage and he orders two gin and tonics and he picks them up like this, you know, like the two of them. And then he gets on stage and, you know, he builds his own guitar. He's very opinionated about the guitar, you know, like, his guitar has no dot markers on the on the frets. He's like, why would you put them there? They're, you know, you need to look at the side, not the top. You know, he, he so he sits down and kind of in a sort of semi gruff way. Okay, Mr. Soundman, I want you to put. He strums the guitar. He goes, I want you to put a bunch of bottom on my guitar. The guy because it. And he said, I want you to put more bottom on my guitar than you've ever put on a guitar. And but it made sense later because he's playing with his fingers and it's he's it's not a strumming, you know. Uh he I I I never saw a, a like a bad side. I mean I heard some stories from Steve. I, you know, he was so Texas. And uh I met Rodney Crowell on the uh Outlaw Country Cruise, and, you know, he figures so highly in the movie, and, you know, he produced those early records, and I love those records. I was kind of, I was kind of shocked to hear that Guy didn't like those records, because I loved those records. And at the time, you know, how when you're young and you're covering songs, it was like, I always wanted to cover one of those songs, but they all mentioned Texas, like, it's like, man, if he could just write a song that didn't men mention Texas, maybe he'd get a big Nashville cut out of it. Yeah, there. Th I, I really loved that movie, and I, I'm lucky that I got to meet him and see him play. And you know, I love the records. I love all of them. Uh, yeah. 
I mean, the idea that he could have all those songs and then right up to the end with that, you know, my favorite picture of you, it's this phenomenal song. If you'd like to hear more Towns Van Zant stories, click on this playlist and I'll see you somewhere down the road. Much love to you.